Welcome to Relationship Reset with life coach, Dr. Mark Shook. In each podcast, Mark will weave together the ancient truths of scripture with the latest cutting edge neuroscience in short, concise, effective, and doable principles and actions to reset your relationship dynamic. Hello, and welcome to Relationship Reset. I'm life coach, Mark Shook, and I am so glad to be joined by my beautiful wife, Laura, today. As we share with you, uh, really we're gonna delve into some of the principles of Dr. John Gottman. And he has a way of predicting divorce with over 90% accuracy. And he's come up with four different concepts that when you see them in a conflict in a marriage are high predictors of divorce. In fact, he has found that as he's watching a conflict play out with a couple, he can predict with 96% accuracy in the first minute of the conflict whether uh, the marriage is going to make it or not. So we want to look at these. He calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He said, you know, when there's negativity and conflict in a marriage, that it's always going to be a negative thing. It's going to be bad for the marriage, but there's four different things if he sees them in the conflict that are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the end. It's getting close to the end of a marriage. And so we're just going to look at those. So I wanted to just kind of first give you an overview. We'll be looking at these in the next three podcasts and coming up with some very specific things to do about them. Um, Laura, why don't you just read through what Gottman says are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and then we'll take a look, closer look at each one of the horsemen. Yeah, let me read them for you. And I think it's interesting because these things are actually very common when you hear what they are. Mm. You may be a little bit surprised. The first one is criticism, just attacks on your partner's character. Um, it, this is a little bit different than just expressing a complaint, but it goes to the level of I'm actually attacking who you are as a person. The second one is defensiveness, and we probably all experience this at some point in our relationships, but it's a self-protective response. Um, when we feel like we're maybe being attacked by our spouse, it usually involves making excuses or shifting blame, but just being defensive of who we are. The third one we see oftentimes is called contempt, and this is where you begin to move to a deeper level where you're um, viewing your partner with disrespect, with disdain, often um, uses criticism, um, uses sarcasm, uses cynicism, um, and can even end up in name-calling. And then the fourth one is called stonewalling, and this is where one of the partners withdraws from communicating with the other partner, and it leads to a a deep emotional detachment. So those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Dr. Gottman calls them, Um, and it's interesting when we begin to see these in our relationships, the predictive factor that they have Mm. for a long-term relationship. We're going to look at the first two today in this short podcast, and so we'll be looking at Uh, criticism and defensiveness. So let's just jump into it, understanding criticism. Criticism involves blaming your partner, and it's different from a complaint. A complaint is simply expressing something that bothers you or makes you anxious. Criticism comes more to the character of your partner. It, It usually has an always or never, like you always or you never. And it's more focused on something broader about your partner that almost seems like something they can't change, something that's indelible to them, something that's just part of their their character. I Let think, I, sorry, I think anytime you hear those words, even if you hear yourself say them always or never, that's kind of a clue to to stop and take a look at what it is you're thinking, what it is you're saying, because... There are very few things in life that are always and never. And so for me, I use that as a kind of a clue that something's going on here that I need to take a look at. I know in our early marriage, I was very, uh, very bad about this. And I would say something like, you always, and Laura would just look at me and go, always? (laughs) And it just kind of stopped me in my tracks, you know, because I realized that I was criticizing. I wasn't offering a complaint. 
Let me just give you an example. A complaint would be like, I'm upset that all through dinner, you only talked about yourself. You didn't ask about me. You didn't ask about my day. And it makes me feel um, not important. But the criticism would be, you never care about my feelings. It's always about you. You're so selfish. And then adding the, the topper, what is wrong with you? So criticism goes beyond voicing a complaint, which focuses on a, on a specific action. Instead, it attacks your partner's character, implying something is fundamentally wrong with them. And it has a huge impact. Tell us a little about the impact of criticism, Laura. I think, you know, when it becomes frequent and something that you and your partner are participating in all the time, it begins to erode the trust and intimacy that the two of you have. And it it can lead to one or the other of you feeling attacked all the time, feeling rejected, feeling hurt, almost always leading to some of the other four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse, like defensiveness or withdrawal as a reaction. Over time, this cycle becomes toxic to the relationship. The environment honestly becomes really toxic, and positive interactions become really scarce. Yeah, it's difficult. You know, Gottman talks a lot about the harsh startup. He says that um, he can predict with 96% accuracy in the first minute of a conversation about a con- or a conflict in a couple, um, where that's going to lead to, and he says it's interesting because harsh startup is especially um, used by the wife more than the husband. We're going to see that the husband uses another one, stonewalling, a lot more than the wife. But it's usually the wife that begins with a harsh startup, with the always or never. It's not always the case because I was the one that did it in our early marriage many times. Of course, sometimes I always think in some of these things, I'm the woman in the marriage because (laughs) I'm always the one that has all the feelings and all the the things like that. But, um, you know, that cycle, it just leads to a really toxic environment. I think the the issue can be with that harsh startup is if you have complaints maybe that you haven't verbalized to one another and shared with one another and you let that build up over time and there begins there comes another complaint and another one and if you're not honest and if you're not connecting and sharing those things and working through them on a regular basis then it's built up to a point that finally you know one or the other of the partners just blurts it all out in a a criticizing kind of way, and it becomes a harsh startup, like you said. And, you know, it, it can be like you have saved up all of these things because you're trying to do good in the relationship. You're trying not to voice all the things that you feel and and all your complaints, but then all of a sudden you have this whole list, so suddenly it becomes like, and here's what's wrong with Laura, and you've got like 27 different things that you, That's that also is part of criticism when you just have this giant list of things that seem mm-hmm. to still go to the character mm-hmm. of the person. You know, the Bible tells us it's so amazing that the ancient wisdom of Scripture and the latest neuroscience come together so often. But listen to what Philippians 4, 5 says. It says, Let gentleness be seen in every relationship, for our Lord is ever near. I really like that. I think as believers... Um, if you're a believer and you've stepped into this relationship with Christ, you can remember, like, would I be saying this if Jesus was sitting right here at the table with us? Is this how I would be responding? Because he is. He's right there. He's with you. He's ever near. And it's a good reminder to always be gentle with each other. And since Gottman can predict with 96% accuracy, if you're not gentle, if there's a harsh startup, that it's going to lead to instability and maybe probably divorce. I think it's really important to get that. Well, let's talk real quickly about just some antidotes um, to criticism. And I think the first one is the gentle startup. Uh, To start with a gentle tone and maybe doesn't always work, but using I statements, you know, like frame your concerns from your perspective. I feel upset. Mm-hmm. When the dishes are left out, it makes me feel like my efforts aren't really valued or appreciated. Um, 
What are some other things you can I do? I think it's important, too, to focus on behavior and not character. To, um, you know, I, I feel disrespected when you, you know, whatever it may be, mm. instead of saying you're disrespectful where you're talking to that person's character. But focus on the behaviors, and I think um, that keeps it from being a personal attack that you way. You know, as parents, we do this a lot of times mm -hmm. with our kids. Like, why are you so clumsy? Why are you so inconsiderate? Why are you so selfish? Those are, those are criticisms because you're, you're pointing to the character instead of a particular thing that, that just happened. Mm -hmm. And said, when that happens, it, it makes me feel this way. Right. Or, you know, and so softening the, the introduction is a huge thing. Start conversations about sensitive topics calmly, respectfully, aiming for a constructive dialogue. Gottman talks a lot about the negative dialogue, and he says that um, in marriages that are in trouble, it's like 80% negative all the time, like always the conversations end up on this negative kind of feel. And if we can focus it more positively, it can make a huge impact. There's this other thing called the XYZ formula. And basically what that is, is if you can think of it this way, when you do X in situation Y, I feel Z. That would be like... You know, when you don't call, when you're going to be late coming home for work, I feel worried. Mm. And you're not attacking you for not calling. I'm not attacking you for being late. I'm just communicating, this is how I feel, and I need your help to not feel that way. Which is a lot different than saying, you never think about me. You never right. call me. You never let me know what's going on. And, um, you know, that makes a lot of times the man feel like, well, what are you like? You need to know everything about my day. Are you trying to control me? What are you trying to do? And we have this sense that the wife is trying to control when really all she's trying to do is connect or maybe even just relieve that anxiousness that, you know, I know where he is. I know he's safe. I know he's, he cares about me still, you know. And so um, if we can practice this formula <laughs> with non-controversial topics and get comfortable using it, we can kind of develop a pattern that's really helpful. I you like know? that idea. Yeah. Um, one of the things I would like for you guys to do as you're listening to this podcast is as soon as it's over, reflect on moments in your relationship where criticism emerged and kind of reframe that whole thing. Consider how using a, a gentle startup could have changed the whole outcome instead of it going back and forth and back and forth. So one of the things that happens when there is criticism, it always inevitably leads to defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's the second horseman of the apocalypse, the, the other one that we're going to look at today, um, that Gottman says we need to understand what defensiveness really is. And it's a natural reaction. If you feel like someone is criticizing you, um, you feel hurt, and we naturally react to defend ourselves because we feel like we're being attacked, we're being criticized. And it, it often involves making excuses or shifting blame or counterattacking, you know, at, uh, attacking back if you feel like you've been attacked. So if somebody says something to you, your spouse says, you know, why aren't the dishes washed, and you start you know, why are you blaming me for not washing the dishes? You're the one that left them out. And you go back and forth in this pattern of hmm. criticism and defensiveness. It's interesting because I think you can see it like in the political debates a lot of times, you know, Absolutely. <laughs> they'll, <clears throat> they'll attack the other person for their the thing. And then it comes right back, not, a, a, you know, a, an attack right back at them about something right. else. Right. And the problem is it exacerbates the conflict. Mm. It doesn't help resolve the conflict. It signals to your partner um, you know, your feelings don't matter to me. They're not valid. I don't think they're worthwhile. And it, it begins to create this barrier between the two of you and, and communication stops. You're not hearing one another. Um, you're not working toward resolving the problem. And so that's why this defensiveness in combination with the criticism is such a bad pattern that we develop. Well, let's talk about the antidote to that, because each one of these, these four horsemen have an antidote. And the antidote is to take responsibility. 
And I would like to encourage you, even if it started with a, a harsh startup and a, a criticism instead of a complaint, Proverbs 15.1, the wisest man who ever lived, gives us some really deep understanding of how we can stop the four horsemen in their tracks right here, right after criticism. He says this, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath. And it's amazing. So if you see like this anger and it's directed at you and you come back with a gentle answer, taking responsibility. And it really goes right along with what uh, James says in his little book in the New Testament. He says this, make this your common practice. Confess your faults to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Now that's the goal of marriage, right? To live together whole and healed and and actually be a force for good in each other's mm -hmm. life. And it's interesting that that little word confess your faults. Confess in the original language, the Greek language of the New Testament, simply means agree with, to agree with. And so when you agree with your spouse, and so taking responsibility even for a small part of the conflict. I think uh, that verse from Proverbs is one of my favorites. It's something I memorized early on after we got married. And um, because and you I had to do it a lot, didn't you? <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> But I found it for me because I tend to speak pretty directly and just say what I think, and, and my tone could sound harsh, not that I meant it that way, but it could come across that way. And so when I found that verse, you know, about a gentle answer and began to, to work on, you know, how do I sound even when I'm saying this to you, even if I'm not angry, even if I'm perfectly content, you know, how do I sound? And so that was... Uh, a good thing for me and our relationship to begin to that I, for me was part of taking on the responsibility yeah. Yeah. that even if everything's good and but I sound negative that's my responsibility yeah. um, so that verse was helpful for it me. it is so interesting sometimes uh, because that was one of the things that I realized early in our marriage is that sometimes your facial expressions <laughs> weren't really communicating what you were feeling inside because you weren't quite as connected to what your feelings right. were early. It took you a while to figure out what you're feeling. You didn't grow up that way thinking of, uh -huh. how do I feel right now? What's the deep underlying feeling of this? And and so I would interpret because of the facial expressions that you made. And it was almost like you had to take time almost looking in the mirror to see what that looked like. Right. And, and, and say, oh, that doesn't look very welcoming. That doesn't look like we're trying to have a good positive conversation. Right. And even to learn because I didn't grow up learning how to share emotions and feelings and um, to learn to figure out what am I feeling exactly and be able to identify it with words and be able then to communicate that with you. Um, that was part of the, you know, if I have a complaint, how do I, how do I say when you do this, I feel this if I don't even know what I'm feeling. And yeah. so I had to um, actually take some time and practice learning, okay, this, this is what I feel in this situation. I'm not angry. I feel dismissed or I'm not, you know, whatever yeah. it may be, learning to um, identify the feelings and then be able to express it. And to it's you. so interesting because um, anger is one of the things, if you don't know what your feelings are um, or it feels vulnerable, Mm -hmm. actually to get there, like you don't trust the other person. And maybe even you grew up in a household where that wasn't okay to express your deep feelings. Nobody knew what to do with them, and it's just uncomfortable. Um, anger is really an armored defense that keeps you from having to be vulnerable. And so a lot of us, it's our go-to everything. It's always anger mm -hmm. because that's armored up, and you don't have to get vulnerable with it. You don't have to kind of go a little deeper and so it, it comes across in this angry way. You know, an example of defensiveness would be like, why are you blaming me for the dishes? You're the one who left them out last time. And if you think about the antidote, taking responsibility, even for a small part of the conflict, it, it can de-escalate the tension, confess your fault, agree together. Maybe you acknowledge the issue. I see that the dishes are a recurring issue, and I'm going to make an effort to be more mindful. You look at that and you're showing understanding for your 
partner's feelings, even if you don't fully agree with the criticism or the complaint that was lodged, (laughs) it's not that we have to agree all the time. It's more about finding this common ground and feeling safe with each other. And I think that's important. I think um, oftentimes when you're newly married, maybe even you think you have to agree on everything or you think you're going to agree on everything. Yeah, you're not. And if you're, (laughs) and if you don't, then something's wrong. But the truth is we're two very different people. Um, We're two individuals. We have different thoughts and ideas and feelings and opinions and beliefs. Um, some of them may be very similar, but sometimes they're not. And um, we shouldn't expect that the other person is going to hold all the same beliefs and opinions. Yeah, that was one of my big issues do. early. I would just keep going round and round in circles to convince you that I was right. Right. You know? And I was so, it was so important. I know I'm right, and I don't know why you insist on being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and if you understand that connection, not agreement, Mm -hmm. that sense of we're still connected. We don't have to agree about this, but we're still connected. So one of the things that you can do, a really practical exercise, I want you to practice this next couple of days, practice making responsibility statements during conflict. Focus on what you can own rather than what's not accurate in the criticism or in the complaint. And this can involve simple acknowledgement Acknowledgements like simply, I understand why you felt hurt by my words or by my inaction. I I can see that. And I think if we practice these two things with criticism and defensiveness, and we really put this into practice, it's going to make a huge difference in the next couple of days. I think so too. Well, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into John Gottman's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. We hope this discussion has provided you with valuable insights and practical tools to enhance your relationship. Remember, every couple experiences these destructive patterns, but awareness and proactive efforts can counter and pave the way for a stronger, more fulfilling connection. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with someone who might benefit And for more resources on building healthy relationships, visit our website or check out um, John Gottman's book. I think it's called The um, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. And uh, we'll see you next time.